Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching The Naturalist Capitalist, and I am your host, Reed Coverdale, and I've got Spike Cohen back on the show. How's it going, Spike? It's going great, Reed. Thanks for having me on again, man. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I've uh, kind of taken off in the libertarian world, which, as you know, isn't very hard. It's a small pond, <laughs> so it's easy to rise. No, but in. you're doing it. You're doing it. You're getting names on there, and you're you're... Uh, I, I'm constantly seeing you in in uh, you along with me in in my mentions on on Twitter. You're you're definitely taking off. Congratulations. Yeah, well, it's a good group of people to be popular with. I like it. Um, the first thing I wanted to say to you is um, uh, I met you uh, in Salt Lake City, and I remember yep. telling you face to face. I said, after this is over, regardless of what happens, please don't go anywhere. And you said. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. And I got to admit, I don't know if I believed you at the time because we have bad history with VP candidates saying they're going to stick around. <laughs> but yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for sticking around. And I love your messaging. I think it's great. You. I think you are uh, the best thing that happened to the Libertarian Party in 2020. So thank you for staying. That means a lot to me, man. Thank you. Yeah. No, I was serious. When people would say, because I get that a lot. I got it from you in Salt Lake City. I got it from people all over. Uh, and they'd say, please don't run away after the election. I'm like, no, I'm not going anywhere. And they're like, OK, but but like really, though. And I'm like, yeah, no, really, I'm not I'm not going anywhere. This isn't about this isn't a jumping off to some other thing like I'm I'm doing. I want to grow the party. And they're like, OK, well, I hope you're really not going to. So, I mean, but I get it. It's uh, it, understandable trust issues. You've got Bill Weld. Uh, Judge Jim Gray, to his uh, credit, has stuck around. He was the 2012 candidate. But then you've got like Wayne Allen Root. Like, no, we have a history of of candidates in general. And if they don't go away entirely, they just you don't really hear from them anymore. It's like they did their time and now they're gone. And that's not how I see this. I, I didn't run to promote myself. I ran to promote the party and our principles and beliefs. And the only way I can do that is by continuing to leverage what attention I can get to talk about our principles and our belief and so forth. So no, I'm not only am I not going anywhere, I I, I expect that you'll be seeing more of me. You may end up, may end up getting sick of me actually. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot more of you over the last, really the last two months probably than I did during the entire campaign. You're kind of, you're on Fox News all the time uh, oh. and you're, you're becoming a more mainstream name. And I, I think that's great. I'm I'm all here for it, so. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and it also goes to show that uh, mainstream media if we only try to get attention during the campaign, we are going to fail because right. for the most part, unless they think you're going to come on there and shill for one of the Republican candidates, you know, Gary and Bill got a lot of attention, but Bill kept going on to tell people to vote for Hillary. And unless you're going to do that, they don't really want you on there. They don't want you to mess up their little Republican, uh, good cop, bad cop routine that they've got going. And so they largely will ignore us. Um, I have gotten in the last two weeks, I have gotten more national media attention, uh, print media, radio media, and TV media than we did during the, than Joe, I think than Joe and I did during the entire 2020 campaign. And this is the off season of the off season. Like there's almost nothing going on for the foreseeable future. This is when you can get the attention because they don't see as much of a risk of, putting out alternative voices during the off season. It's when it gets closer that they go, oh, I think we're just gonna do the Republican Democrat thing. So it's important. This is why we can't go away. This is why, you know, the one the one criticism that libertarians get outside of libertarian circles, and I think it's a legit one, is where are you the other three and a half years? Uh, right. You know, it, it appears as though you show up every six months. And at the top of the ticket, at the national level, that's a valid criticism. There's a lot of libertarian stuff happening year round at the local and state level, but nationally, I mean, you, you, you'll get some interviews, but it, there really hasn't been a full court press in the past. And, and that's what I hope to continue pushing is, you know, giving a voice to the movement for human liberty 24 seven, 365. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Um, I'll be blunt, uh, not just your race, but every, almost every libertarian race was a huge disappointment the way it turned out as far as vote totals go last year. I mean, in, in, for me at least. Uh, so I wanted to talk about first, 
uh, from your criticisms, what would you have done differently if you could go back in time? And then after we talk about that, I want to talk about the machine that was against you that didn't let you guys get anywhere. Um, right. So, so first, like, if uh, what do you think? Were there any major mistakes that you think you guys made? If you could oh, yeah. redo them, how would you do things differently? Just kind of go into that. So two things that really shine, because um, I, I don't want to, and, and to be clear, I'm not throwing Joe under the bus here. Uh, one of these things is something that we both, I think, did wrong. Um, and then the other thing is straight up something I did wrong. Um, and so the first thing was, and and to my credit, I tried to stop this, but it was kind of too late by then. We kind of went in with the idea that we were going to present the entire libertarian platform during the campaign. The, the problem with doing that is we already have very scarce attention and time from people. And so when we're talking about 10 or 15 different things, people will often, it gets muddled. They're not sure exactly what, and especially when within their time, within their, their narrative frame, it looks like our stuff's contradictory. Well, wait a second, you're pro immigration, but you're also pro gun. What, what are you? And we don't have time to explain the, the concept of self-ownership. This is what the off season's for, right? So what we should have done, uh, and, and to my credit, about partway through the summer, I started saying this, but it was kind of too little too late at that point. What we should have done was pick two or three things and hammer away at those with good libertarian talking points all the way through and try to leverage and get attention by being bold and, and strong and dynamic and engaging in the way that we message it in a way that connects with people to have people go, wow, they're really... Wow, they're spot on about that. I wonder what they think about other stuff. Instead, we said, this is what we think about everything. And people were like, well, right. people, I'm, I'm not sure what you think about my specific issue, that I'm, and I'm not going to take the time to look through all of it. We should have hammered away at the lockdowns, COVID and, and, and healthcare in general, but especially related to COVID, just the flat out failures that the government had to allow healthcare workers to do their job that led to COVID spreading out of control in the first place. You know, putting uh, COVID patients in nursing homes, uh, you know, all the nonsense that government did that made it way worse and made way more deadly. Uh, yeah. And then how the lockdowns have just been devastating and, and have done essentially nothing long term to slow the spread. And then during the summer, especially when the uh, Black Lives Matter protests and stuff were happening, talking about police brutality, the war on drugs and, you know, the, the, the protests and the riots. You know, we should have been messaging that guns don't just protect protesters from abusive cops. Guns also protect private property owners from rioters and looters. That right. and, you know, what a unifying message that we support protesting. We are against rioting and looting. And here is a way to solve both of those things. And also, here's a way to solve what led to the protests in the first place: ending qualified immunity, ending the war on drugs, and so forth. And so we should have done that. Um, the other problem is that when you present all your ideas, you're giving someone a reason to pick through and go, oh, okay, I don't agree with that. I'm voting for this guy over here that I disagree with 80% of the time. So <laughs> you're really like, it's not a good idea. Uh, yeah. Joe Biden and Donald Trump, they essentially ran on, I'm not Joe Biden and I'm not Donald Trump. Right. So if we had come in with two or three issues where we're saying, hey, why are they neither of these folks talking about this? Here's the solution to it. We could have really made track. Are we gonna win? We No, we wouldn't have won, but we could have done better. Um, mm -hmm. And then, I can tell you my personal failing. Early on, um, I had never run in a in a, anything like this before. Uh, I've operated a business before, um, but that's completely different than operating a business while simultaneously traveling to a different state every single day. And so I kind of, after the convention, when we really started just, I, I really was only home maybe like 10 days out of that entire uh, five months of the, of the end of the campaign. Um, I had a social media team and they were so good that I said, okay, we'll collaborate on stuff. You know, I'll post stuff. We'll collaborate on things that you can post. And if there's stuff that you want to post outside of that on my social media, you can go ahead and post that. I don't need to review it. That was a major mistake. And, and in retrospect, here's why that was a major mistake. They could put out 150, 200 things that were spot on, totally accurate, you know, the way that I would say it pretty much. And then we can have a trans genocide post. Right. And everyone now focuses on that. Yeah. Now, that was ultimately my fault because 
I didn't put that control in place of saying, hey, listen, before anything gets put out, I need to be able to look at it even just for a few minutes uh, and probably make some stylistic changes just to make it sound more like it's coming from me or even just maybe what you've what you put together isn't isn't, you know, something that I that I agree with or would put out. The transgenocide post was based on an article from I think it was Pink News or Queer News or something like that, LGBT news outlet that took some data uh, about murders and skewed it very heavily uh, to make it look like tra- there's this genocide, growing genocide against trans people. And if you actually look at the data, it shows that the reason there's been a massive uptick in reported trans murders is because they didn't used to say whether someone was trans or not. 10 years mm-hmm. ago, there was like no police department uh, that was doing that. And five years ago, there were very few. Now, almost all of them are. So, of course, there's going to be an increase. And there's been a general uptick in murders to be in the last few years anyway. So, you know, if I, that had been shown to me, if I had had that that control in place and it had been shown to me, I would have said, guys, this data is not. Yeah, no, we're not putting this out. Yeah, It got put out. And now there are still many, many people that <laughs> the first thing they'll bring up is that might be one of the questions that has, that has been asked to ask him about transgenocide, even though I have since explained what happened yeah. uh, and said that, you know, and then and then like within 24 hours of that happening, we had all new protocols in place. Everything moving forward from there was put in front of me for me to review, um, made my my job a lot harder because I'm also on a bus and on a plane and everything else. But I made sure, you know, everything else I, I've at least looked at it and said, yes. And, and I would say it was only maybe 10 percent of the stuff that was being put out was something that I had, you know, that I hadn't written at all. Most things were either posted by me or or posted in collaboration where I would work with the team to put together something. We'd work together and make something and then put it out. Um, so there wasn't a lot of stuff, but it, it just took that one thing. And so in retrospect, I should have had that control in, in place from the beginning. And ultimately, all of the ridicule and everything that came from it falls directly on me because that was my fault. Um, would that have changed the overall outcome if that transgenocide post had happened? Would we have gotten five percent? No. If right. the if uh, if we had been pitch perfect in our execution of you know hammering away at two or three issues, would that have led to us getting uh, to winning or getting ten percent or five percent? I, I strongly doubt it would have gotten us to 5%. I think the absolute best we could have done was somewhere between 2% and the the 3% that that Gary and 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 Bill got in 2016. And here's why. We got absolutely no coverage from media because this was a presidential re-election campaign or, right. or uh, yeah, pr- presidential presidential re-election race. And in that kind of a time, in that kind of a framework, voters are much more motivated to either vote to replace someone to get, kick them out or vote to keep them in. With 2016, right. it was Hillary and Trump, but they were both trying to get in. And so there was a little bit more attention. Plus, again, the media had no problem with giving Bear, Gary and Bill attention because Bill was going on there constantly to tell people to vote for Hillary. Um, so, you know, it, so I, I don't think that we could have beaten the previous record. I don't think that we could have, you know, gotten 5% or, or, or certainly not one. And that's a problem. The fact that we are still almost 50 years, actually, we're coming up on our 50th anniversary of the creation of the Libertarian Party. The fact that we are still reliant on factors that have nothing to do with us or our campaign or our party or our messaging or the incredibly hard work being done by grassroots activists across the country, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of activists working incredibly hard. The fact that we are relying on factors that have absolutely nothing to do with us to determine whether we get 1% or 3% is a problem. The problem is that we just aren't big enough. We don't have enough of a voter base. We don't have enough happening at the grassroots level. And it's not because there aren't people that are trying to do it. It's because there hasn't been a comprehensive plan to actually look at and focus on, well, after many decades, we have a culture of losing. I can't tell you how many people came up to me and congratulated me on how we did. And I'm like, we got, just go over, we got 1.3%. And they're like, yeah, but you know, if you think about it, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we got 1.3%. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but you know, we did this, we did, and, and there were some positives. Uh, yeah. Membership is up 50, is up 50%. And, and we can't take all that credit, but I'll certainly take some of it. 
Um, yeah. The uh, number of registered libertarians in their states are around 10, attempt has increased by 10%. These are all positive things. We got the a rounding error and that's a problem. Yeah. We have a culture of losing. We need to end the era of losing admirably and and do how people win and grow. And the way that you win and grow is a, you learn from your mistakes, but you also learn from your successes. We had dozens of people that won their local and regional races uh, in this in this election season, uh, libertarians that won. We have hundreds of libertarians that have won their elections over the years. Uh, mm -hmm. We have something like, uh, I think, 400 elected libertarians right now across the country. Let's talk to them. Let's figure out what's been successful for them. And then let's scale that. Let's replicate it for many more local races, but then let's begin to scale that so that we can start winning state, more state legislative races, gubernatorial races, mayoral races. Let's look at what made Donald Rainwater get, you know, the, the record for someone running for governor as a libertarian. Let's see what got Ricky Harrington, you know, 33% uh, of the vote. Uh, in a deep red state. Let's look at how these things happen and then let's learn what worked, what didn't work, and then replicate it and work on an actual game plan to win. And let's come up with attainable goals, uh, like growing the number of local affiliates, uh, increasing the, the number of registered libertarians and, and, and libertarian members, and let's do it now. Yeah. Not early 2024 or late exactly. 2023 let's do it now and right. let's always be doing it so that was my main takeaway yeah i completely agree and uh that um the summary of what you said that you could have been better about the campaign i actually agree because i remember watching videos and it every single town hall that Joe did, it seemed like a lecture on libertarianism. And even I was kind of falling asleep. And I think you're right that if you hammer three issues, because that's what, uh, yeah, that's even what Trump and Biden did to an extent, you know, they would that's go to just do. a few issues and they could suck on everything else and no one would care because they're hitting home with their few issues. So I, I think that's with totally right. Issues, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, now keep it, keep in mind, Joe is a, uh, a professor or senior lecturer. So right. th that's what she was doing. Right. And I was kind of, and I'm not blaming Joe here because that was essentially my thought too. Well, let's educate people about liberty. Now, you educate people about liberty now. Right. The end of the, you know, through this year, even coming into 2022, there's a point where you kind of phase from education to helping the candidates that are running in the midterms. Like right. you, there, there has to be this phase, and it doesn't mean that the education stops, but certainly in the heat of, uh, and, and we also need to pick our candidates sooner but that's a whole other subject that's a that's an internal party thing we we need right. to give our candidates more than six months to run for office oh, it's, yeah, it's absurd totally. but <laughs> it's that's a whole other subject but yeah. if especially if we're only giving them six months we need to have already done all this other stuff beforehand so that we have as many people as possible that have heard our ideas you know reed i'm sure you've seen it i've seen it folks that are watching this i'm sure you've seen it you see that light bulb moment when you give our ideas to people and they go holy crap wow that makes sense uh -huh. I, I went across the country. It happened thousands of times uh, uh, in, in events across the country where people would come out because they see this giant blue bus that says something about running for president on it. And they see me, you know, yelling into this, you know, into the AV system and it's reverberating through their neighborhood. And they're like, what the hell is this guy talking? And he comes out, they come out and, uh, you know, they're like, why are these people cheering? Like, what is happening? And I always did Q&A at every single event. I'm like, I would I'd give like a 10 minute speech. I'm not a speech person. I am a answer questions person. It doesn't matter what you think of, of, of my droning on. What matters is my answer to your question, what you care right. about. And so I would do like an hour of Q&A at every event. And we try to get at least like at least nine or 10 questions answered at, at every event. And, uh, and, it, and it was in those moments that we'd see the people go, Oh, wow, that makes perfect sense. Imagine if we were doing that, not just me, but all of us were doing right. that constantly and yeah. doing it at the grassroots level and bringing people in. That's It's what we have to do. We, we have been waiting for the Hail Mary pitch of the national media just deciding to give us a bunch of attention and let us on the debate stage and then we get to catapult to the White House. It's not, it's not going to happen. They have a vested interest in keeping us away from it. And we don't have enough attention behind us to warrant them doing it in the first place. We have to build it. We have to build it. And that happens at the grassroots level. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I actually didn't join the party until last year. Um, 
in 2016, you know, I supported Rand Paul, and that was a joke in the Republican Party. This last year, uh, uh, in 2019, I supported Tulsi Gabbard in the Democrat Party, also a joke, didn't go anywhere. And then I realized, like, okay, the Libertarian Party is what I believe in, and I'm not involved in it. So what am I doing? You know, I've got to, <laughs> I've got to actually join because I was kind of while the convention was going on with Hornberger and Vermin and you know Justin yep. Amash and everyone, I was just kind of sitting there and I'm like, okay, I can't do anything. I've wasted all my time campaigning for someone in the duopoly who they're never going to let go anywhere where there's this party that is full of people who want the same things I do. I'm not fighting 95% of the party to try to get the issues I care about to the top. So I joined and my whole message has been, if you want the Libertarian Party to go somewhere, you have to join and get involved and do things. You can't just sit on the sidelines and hope that it's that hope that it evolves because that's what everyone's saying. They're like, well, if the Libertarian Party gets serious and wins something, then I'll get involved. It's like they're not yeah. going to unless yeah. you join. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I you know I I say this to people a lot. Um, I get you know where people will say, oh, you know, Joe should have done this better. Uh, you know, I don't know why we picked Joe as the candidate or I don't know, you know, why, why was there a guy with a boot on his head or what, you know, they'll say all this stuff and I'll say, hey, man, uh, or, or lady or whatever. I'll say, hey, listen, I, I, uh, I'm going to be at your state convention. Um, right. I'd love to hear your thoughts about how we can grow. Yeah. And uh, and I'm not being I'm not teasing. Well, I'm teasing a little, but I, I'm serious. Like, come on out. And I would love to have that conversation with you. Like, yeah. let's let's figure out if there are certainly many things that could have been done better in this campaign, in this party, in many other smaller campaigns. You know, the down ballot races. There's all sorts of things. And more importantly than that, we need help. Like right. the more people that are out there doing it, if we represent your values and your beliefs and you think you can help us improve. We can't wait for you to join us. Yeah. Yeah. So I here's another thing. I think that the nominee has to be a principled libertarian, but that doesn't mean that every person joining has to agree with the entire party platform it plank for it plank. It's just it, it's no. so ridiculous. And there's so much gatekeeping. And, you know, what sort of one half of the party holds a few issues really close to the you know, really close to the chest. And then the other half holds yep. a few different issues. And if you don't agree on those few issues, even if they agree on everything else, they're pushing these potential party members away. Um, <laughs> and it's so it's ridiculous because problem. they disagree with their own party on half of the issues at least. And they'll be like, okay, this libertarian party thing, you know, I'm going to check it out. And they come check it out. Board, and then people are screaming at them because they don't agree with open borders or they don't think we should be allowed to own machine guns or whatever it is. And, you know, they, they or, or, or they think or they think that, you know, there's a right to health care. So why isn't the government providing health care? But here's the thing we have to remember, Reed. They've never heard our ideas before. Right. Or they've heard one or two things that got enough of their attention for them to join us, knowing that at least for now, it, the odds of us winning are very low and they're still interested in us. So why would we not? When someone comes in and goes, yeah, you know what? I'm interested in libertarianism, but if we open our borders, then we're not a nation. What an op excellent opportunity to talk to them about the original purpose of the borders. Uh, right. Talk to them about what immigration looked like in the founding of the country. Look and tell them about how it was labor unionists that created liber uh, 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 created uh, immigration restrictions. Talk to them about the Byzantine Le Leviathan surveillance state that has to be created tr to try to enforce these restrictions. Like, but you right. can't have that conversation if you say, get out. If you say, yeah. oh, you don't agree with me on this thing that I think is really important, get the hell out. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh -huh. Or someone coming in and going, yeah, you know, how I can't tell you how many times I'd hear, you know, libertarianism sounds good to me, but, I mean, we need to have a, a minimum wage. We need to have, uh, you know, free health care. We need to, you know, who's going to pay my student loans? And the, the standard libertarian answer is, you lazy bum, you know, you, you must think that you're entitled to my, my labor. I guess you agree with slavery. And no, what they said was, I'm worried about how my health care and my college tuition and my, and my, how I'm going to be able to make ends meet. So right. answer that. We are better than Democrats on things that their voter base cares about. Our ideas actually make sense. Right. We are better than Republicans on things that their voter base cares about. Our ideas actually make sense. Yeah. We, and, and for centrists and everyone else, our ideas work and are better. So why the hell are we arguing with them? Why right. wouldn't we say, yeah, you know what? Healthcare really is an important thing. Here's 
why our healthcare system is a mess, and here's how our ideas could fix it. Right. And do that with everything, UBI, uh, uh, foreign policy, immigration, whatever. Present the idea of why that's a problem in the first place and then how we're going to fix it. The right. alternative is to, is to either say it's one because we're given a false binary choice that we either have to tell everyone to stay out or we have to welcome them in and not challenge them on their bad ideas. Well, those are both terrible ideas, terrible solutions for their own unique reasons. You bring them in. What's the per, per point of bringing someone into your orbit if you don't then affect them with your gravity? Like the whole point of bringing them in is for them to join the the, the thing you've created. So yeah, bring them in, bring them all in. We have to. Like the, yeah. people that are self-described libertarians cannot win at the national level or, or at the state level. We have to bring yeah. more people in and then show them why our ideas work. That that's that it's crucial to do both of those things. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing is like, there's a couple things I disagree with you on. Uh, I disagree with Dave Smith on a couple things. I disagree with Justin Amash on a couple things. Yeah, and I, yeah. But um, what was pissing me off so much around the beginning of the year was I was seeing the right implode from Donald Trump's loss. And then the far left, not so much the establishment left, but the far but left. The far left. Yeah. They were imploding as well because there yep. was that going on with Jimmy Dore and forced the vote and TYT, you know, like, so I was like, okay, this is the perfect opportunity for us to shine. And everyone was eating each other alive and it pissed me off. And I don't know, actually, I don't actually know if you're aware of how this ended up happening, but I made a tweet on January 1st and I tagged you, Dave Smith, like a, a whole bunch of people in it. Yep. And I, it was just basically like, can we get along? And then everyone started commenting and then that's when you and Dave started talking to each other and you talked about how you thought the campaign could have been better and he started complimenting you. And then everyone started kind of coming together and saying, hey, you know, yeah, I mean, we all do agree on a lot more than we do. So why do we- 95% of things, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, I, I'm seeing us move in that direction. There are still people who are always gonna be gatekeepers. There are always people who are gonna, you know, call you a statist or a racist or whatever just to, impede the movement from going forward but i'm seeing people realize the bigger picture in the libertarian party now and i'm getting messages from friends who have been democrats or republicans their whole lives and they're done and i've never seen that before i mean i've seen them pissed off at mitt romney or you know at hillary clinton or whatever but yep. never i am done with this party i want to see what the libertarian party holds and I, I think we're actually setting ourselves up. So uh, you, it seems like you, Dave Smith, and Justin Amash are kind of the the spearheads of the movement of trying to recruit people. I would say more or less. Uh, so what's the plan going forward? What do you, uh, do you guys have? Do you guys talk with each other much, or you each got your own thing going, or how does that work? I think it's both. I think we're all we're both all doing our our own thing to the extent that we have our own various strategies. But we no, I I talk with Justin and and Dave on a fairly regular basis. Like I mean, it's not close uh close coordination or anything like that. But I'm certainly open to more coordination with it. Um and you know ultimately I think the plan is there are as libertarians we recognize that often decentralization and letting people kind of choose their own path to try to do something is the best way forward, which is why, you know, I do think that there should be a comprehensive messaging and, and communications and strategy coming from the national party. But in terms of like what Dave Smith, I think Dave Smith should keep doing what Dave Smith's doing. I think Justin Amash should keep doing what Justin Amash is doing. I'm certainly going to keep doing what I'm doing. I think Vermin Supreme should keep yeah. doing what Vermin Supreme is doing. Exactly. I think that whatever is working for people is reaching people that that works for, you know, with Vermin. Um, there are people that don't want to hear a thing from anyone who appears to be taking this seriously. Right. Because they see it as a joke, right? They'll right. listen to George Carlin talk about how no one cares about you. They'll listen to uh, they'll even listen to like Jimmy Kimmel or, uh, or or Stephen Colbert, even though ultimately they're just giving them establishment agitprop. But right. but they're presenting it in a way that, oh, I think this whole thing's a joke. So when someone like Vermin shows up, they're like, that guy gets it. Ha, ah, that's funny. And then the more they listen to him, they're like. Uh oh, I'm learning things. And that's, but, and I watch it happen in real time. I mean, they call it boot pilling. Like it, it, it so that's a whole method. 
You know, mm-hmm. just Namash is appealing to people who are, you know, conservative, constitutionalist, classical, liberal. You know, he talks a lot about the rule of law, and that's not really something I talk a lot about, but mm-hmm. he talks about that. And if that's bringing people in, great. And, you know, uh, David Smith is, it, Dave Smith's obviously out there, you know, he's more kind of appealing to the right, um, although he's not against talking to the left by any stretch. Um, right. And he's using his form of message, messaging to bring them in. And I think that's great. I'm using my form of messaging to, to reach out to people and bring them in. Look at this game stock thing. Look at this thing with 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 Wall Street bets. I have yeah. gotten so much traction on telling people just stra- straight out, this is not a free market. And that's a, that's appealing to people on the far left, the establishment left, the centrist, that everyone can agree, oh, wow, yeah, no, this system isn't free market. Right. Okay, good. So let's have a free market. Like since we all now agree that this system is sucks and and you know and and is is not what we want, even if we yeah. label it, even if this guy labels it capitalism, this guy labels it socialism, we're all agreeing that this is not a free market and we do not like this. We have all requested the opposite of this. So why do we not why what, let's set the market free, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. And so, you know, so I, I've done very well with that. And that's and that's the type of messaging that I've been doing is taking topical issues and explaining why they're bad and why 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 what's happening is bad, why it's not going to work the way Republicrats have tried to say it's going to work, how they're the ones who created the problem and how our common sense ideas fix it. And I think that the most important thing is that we need to recognize that the vast majority of people that we are bringing in are not going to immediately be gold pilled and say, wow. I am now 100% libertarian. <laughs> I've been super Saiyan here, and I'm now, you know, fully embracing the concept of laissez-faire, uh, you know, free market economics, and you know, the Austrian school. You know, like, it's it's not going to happen like that. They're right. going to go, wow, you make a good point there. What about healthcare? And you have to have a good answer for that. Yeah. Or they might come in and go, wow, you got a good point there. But man, I think if all these immigrants come in, they're going to take our jobs. Okay, well, let's explore that. Like that's yeah. not that comes from a legitimate concern. Uh, yep. We recognize that that's not what's causing it, but we have to have an answer for them. If we go, oh, sounds like you don't like, you know, brown people and you want concentration camps or yeah. it sounds like you think you're <laughs> you're owed the product of my labor to pay for your health care. You've lost them. And now they hate you. Yes. Now, not only do they not want to hear you, they're going to actively be against anything because basically what they heard was, I don't give a shit about you or your ideas or what you care about or anything. I just. I have this philosophical framework, and if your ideas, if your questions don't fit within it, I don't really care what you're going through. That's a terrible way to message to people. We have to message to people that we do care about them, that we recognize what they're going through, that we understand how we got here, and then we can take them on the journey for how libertarianism works. Yeah, so 2022 – we've got to win something in my mind. Like we're, we're getting desperate here. We got to win something on the federal level, you know, either mm-hmm. a Senate seat or a how just something somewhere. So um, I felt yeah. like the party kind of failed at the, this last year. Like I, I was having people on my show when I was half the size I am now, you know, I was having yeah. Brad Barron, Elias Sherman, uh, you know, all these people who were running for Congress and my videos were getting like 100 views with them on and they'd have like 300 followers on Twitter or whatever. It was just abysmal. Right. And so what can we do uh, to really push down ballot candidates who are running in the states for 2022? What's uh, What can people do to uh, either change their party, their, their state party's messaging or whatever? Like what, what's the best strategy going forward for that? Well, the best thing we can do as individuals is pay attention to these folks, give them attention, share their content, retweet them, whatever you're doing on social media, talk to your loved ones about, you know, why you, you know, why you're a libertarian, why you think, you know, that's the kind of stuff we can do individually. Uh, If you want to get more involved, then, you know, uh, join, uh, contact your, if you haven't already joined the LP, join the LP, uh, get involved with your state uh, affiliate. Uh, your state uh, party and uh, then see if there's a a local affiliate. And if there's not, they can give you the resources to start one. Like these are the infrastructural things all of us can do in terms of messaging. I think it's important. We need to look at what has, well, in terms of messaging, we need to be solidly libertarian, but we have to use what I call, I I call it gold messaging, but it's basically just a gimmicky name for uh, making friends and influencing people. And, Mm -hmm. and, and, and what works for that? Like I've had people that ask me like, well, you know, what are the books I should read about libertarianism? And I'm like, well, if you want to learn more about the ideas, 
you know, uh, uh, you know, there's the law by Bastiat, there's no treason by Spooner, there's, you know, man economy in the state, there's, you know, I can name off a bunch of these things. Uh, but honestly, if it's about how can we win, how to make friends and influence people like that, that would be a, 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 a primer for how to be able to reach people with anything. It's, it's what I learned in over 20 years of business in, uh, in, in sales and marketing. And it's what I'm applying now to the way that I, I message to people. And it, it works. You empathize with them where they are. Um, you go in without preconditions. They don't have to accept your first principles before you talk to them. Uh, go into their spaces from their precepts. Listen to what they're saying. Ask them questions. Empathize with them. Demonstrate that you actually care about what they're going through. Reflect back that you were listening to them by explaining that you, you know, that you get where they're coming from on this. Explain how we got here because you've now said that that you know there's an old phrase. Uh, no one cares. No one cares what you know until they know they know that you care. So mm -hmm. show them that you care first. Then you can lay on that foundation, the beginning of the framework of well, here's how we got here. Here's how we can fix it. Um, but you have to do that 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 first in, in initial work. In terms of elections, how we do well with elections, like I said, there are libertarians that have won city council races, mayoral races, um, state legislative races in districts that are roughly the same size as a congressional race. It can be done. What right. we have to do is identify good dynamic candidates that uh, aren't just principled. Uh, well, they have to be principled because if, if they're not principled, if they're not principled libertarians, then we might as well back a Republican or Democrat. But they, mm. they need to be principled. But they also have to be engaging. They have to be able to connect with people. They have to be able to uh, show that they've been uh, engaged with their community before they started running for Congress. Congress is completely different than, you know, like a, a city council or county council rates or race or running for like the, the parks board or something like that. Like you really have to show that you're a person of that community uh, for them to take you seriously. Uh, especially if you don't have millions of dollars backing you up for for your campaign, you really have to show that you're connected. So let's find these folks. Let's find these people that are very connected in their communities, that are able to you know present a message that connects with people, and then let's pour our resources into them, and not and not just money, time, effort. Let's help help you know join their team as a volunteer, do what you can to help them, uh, you know do text banking for them. You know we can win this. You know we can win this. We we win races that are not that don't require that much more scaling to go from city or state to, to a federal congressional race. A Senate race is tough. A yeah. gubernatorial race, winning an entire state right now, if it's not like Wyoming or you know New Hampshire, like a, a very low uh, population uh, and one that isn't really uh, uh, fought for very hard, like trying to win, for example, in like a, a swing state or something like that. I don't know that we're going to be there by 2022. I'd love to think we are, and I'll certainly you know, do everything I can to grow the party so that we can. But mm. right now, we are ready to win a congressional race. Right. We just have to do the things that require to do it. Take what is working, scale it up slightly, and then apply that. Do the door knocking. Do all, all the stuff that, you know, that's why I started my show Culture of Winning on, on Mondays at 8. I talk with libertarians who have gotten elected and talk to them about how they did it. And I mean, these are people, some of them fought in hard fought three-way races, and they did the hard work on the ground to be able to win that. And it would take, with just a little bit of scaling, they could win a congressional race that way. So I, I think we are well poised for 2022 to win some house races. Um, and if we can win some house races by 2024, when now there's going to be a lot of media attention that comes from well, now it's not just someone talking and someone trying to run for office. They're actually in federal office. They will have to get the libertarian side. Even if there's only like two of them or three of them, they'll have to get the Republican side, the Democrat side, and the libertarian side, especially if things are so close that the libertarians are a wedge. And that will grow our, our reach exponentially. And one of them may, may end up being the, the presidential candidate as a result of that, that they can get that much attention. So no, I, I think that we are, are poised to be able to do that which by 2024 poises us to be able to win senatorial races, to be able to win gubernatorial races. And, and I mean, if all if everything lines up to even be able to win the White House, but at the very least, qualify to make it on the damn debate stage. Right. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, so the last thing I want to ask you before we get to the questions, um, sure. we were talking about it a little bit before we started recording. Um, I love Ron Paul, but the reason I love him is he was loved for his message you know, um, it, it was for what he was saying. And yeah. 
you know, a lot of these other people like Bernie Sanders, you know, they're, they're not really loved for what they do or what they say. It's kind of their personality, their hairstyle, you know, if they're hot or whatever. And right, right. Uh, I tried so hard last year to get people off the cult of personality because they had their favorite candidate who ran, whether it was Tulsi Gabbard or Bernie Sanders or Bill Weld, whoever it was. And Andrew I'd be like, Yang, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'd be like, look, you care about, you know, if you voted for Tulsi, you care about civil liberties and ending the wars. Look at Joe Jorgensen. Look at the ideas that she represents. It didn't matter. Like people are just so, so hung up on cult of personality. They want their person in there. I'm kind of giving up on <laughs> getting around that. So what are your thoughts? Is it possible to get people to care about ideas more than their celebrity getting into office? It is certainly possible, but y you have to remember, we have been conditioned for a long period of time to accept our next king. Right. And the only way that that can be acceptable in our heads is if that king or that ruler or whatever is someone that we like. And mm -hmm. so that's why there's this whole celebrity thing. Like our last president was a reality show star. Like that, <laughs> that was really like the, that was really like the extent of and, and he actually was doing reality TV before there was such a thing. I remember, you know, the Saturday Night Live uh, skits making fun of Trump in like the 80s when I was a kid. Like yeah. he has been, you know, everyone knows who he is. And so that's why they were going for the, you know, the the 100 percent name recognition and, 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 and so forth with that. Joe Biden largely ran on, hey, remember that guy Obama that you all liked? I was his <laughs> vice president and right. I'm not Trump. And that they won. It, it worked. Uh, really, it was I, I'm not Trump that worked more. Most people, it, it was very interesting. Mo, Joe Biden won a landslide, despite the fact that most of his supporters didn't act. He wasn't their first, second, third, or even fourth choice. But mm -hmm. he wasn't Trump. So they were like, all right, screw it. I, I just can't stand Trump anymore. Yeah. I have watched post-election that there were people who, you know, and obviously I'm on a much smaller scale in terms of, of name recognition, but there were people that are like, oh, Spike, you're amazing. And I'm like, hey, thanks. That's not what we should be talking about. Let's talk about, you know, like here are the ideas, here are the, you know, like you said, the ideas, the principles and so forth. And they're like, yeah, spike 2024. And I'm like, yeah, okay, again, let's talk about, you know, this thing. And so, you know, it's it, it, like, I mean, there's a, someone's making a coloring book of me now. Like it's, 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 <laughs> and it's funny and it's cute and it's whatever, like it didn't bother me, but it's like, guys, this, like the reason that my, my, I guess my slogan or whatever is you are the power is because I'm trying to say this is about you and your loved ones and your community and your self ownership and, and your personal autonomy and how we, you and we as individuals work best together. And then people are like, yay, spike. And so I'm kind of in a similar place where you are right now yeah. where I'm like, okay, fine. If that's what it takes, so be it, but I'm going to keep talking about what matters. Like I, I didn't do this to get my own name out there. I did this to get our ideas out there. I did right. this to get the party and the movement, some serious traction. It's why I haven't gone away. I would have loved to go to Barbados for all of December. Right. I actually really wanted to, but like <laughs> if this were about just serving me, I would I would have taken a couple months off and people would be sweating right now saying, is Spike really coming back or what's Because I would be like, no, it's vacation time uh, after after, you know, campaign is it's fun and it was challenging and I loved every second of it. But yeah, no, I would have loved a little breathing time. But this isn't about me. This is about the movement. This is about the party. This is about setting people out of cages. This is out of, uh, you know, giving people their lives, restoring their lives back after being destroyed by bad policy. This is about ending these absurd destructive lockdowns this is about ending wars this is about ending the the monopoly money system that's gamed and rigged for a small handful of incredibly powerful people that's what this is about and uh i'm going to continue focusing on that and there are some people that are are, are are going to for whatever reason be focused on me as an individual person and if that's what it takes for them that's fine but all i'm going to be talking about the whole time is uh is you know what actually matters and and I, I guess that's all we can do man like there are going to be some people that are drawn to us because of our personalities okay like that's fine but you know it, it's we're very libertarians tend to be very cerebral mm -hmm. so we're more attracted to ideas and logic and 
you know, it's not the person in front of us. Although with Ron Paul, there's certainly a lot of, uh, you know, loving Ron. And mm-hmm. yes, it was we love Ron because of his ideas, but we also loved Ron because of his bravery, right? Mm-hmm. right. Keep in mind, this is a man that was saying end the war on drugs in the 80s. Right. Like <laughs> everyone, yeah. he would go on TV shows and get laughed at by the audience. Oh, you want cocaine to be le- illegal or to be legal? Oh, so you want junkies on the streets? And he would patiently and, and bravely explain it to an audience that was universally laughing at him. Well, who's yeah. laughing now? Right. He 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 got up on a debate stage, Republican debate stage, saying what no other Republican would say, which is that these wars were pure and big government imperialism, that they were based on lies, and you know that 9/11 was blowback. He said in late 2001. <laughs> 9-11 was blowback. That's right. why we love him, right? Because mm-hmm. he said stuff that it's like, it's the equivalent of us getting up right now and saying, these lockdowns are stupid. They right. aren't working. You're making people's lives miserable. And a lot of people that in the back of their head, it's sort of like an emperor has no, clo- has no clothes moment where it's like, yeah, I think that too. I'd never say it though, because I don't want to get browbeat by the, you know, by the, 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 the branch covidians uh, about this about this thing you know so but they'll follow someone who's brave enough to say it but that will attract some cult of personality and i think it's just important it's not that we necessarily shun it we just don't feed it right we focus on what led them to love us so much in the first place which is the principles and the and being brave and saying the things that most other people are scared to say and if some of them get stuck up on the personality then you know, it is what it is, but you know, we just have to stick true to what, who we are. Okay. So I've got like 10 questions here. So I know it's easy to go into like a 10 minute diatribe about each one, but if you want to just yeah, yeah, yeah. keep it as short as you can. So sure. uh, do you like caucuses in the libertarian party or do you think they're divisive? I think caucuses serve a purpose of the, the purpose of a caucus is to influence inner party workings and say, you know, uh, well, we stand for this set of principles. So I think caucuses serve a good purpose. I think what is now happening is because there's so much disagreement between the caucuses, they're now trying to do outreach, which is great, but they often are doing outreach to try to bring people in to their side to affect the internal party politics. And I think the problem with that is that you can create division as a result of that. It's why I'm so focused. I'm glad you're doing it too. I'm so focused on unifying. I have lots of great friendships and, and, and working relationships with people in the Mises caucus. I was endorsed by the Mises caucus. Uh, right. I have a ton of really great uh, relationships in the Prague caucus. Um, I have great relationships in the radical caucus. I was endorsed by the radical caucus. Right. Uh, I have great relationships in the, uh, in, in the audacious caucus, which is sort of the polar opposite of the, of the Mises caucus. Uh, and, and I created the waffle house caucus. Like, you know, the, there's, there's, I, I've, I've, you know, I've tried to, to, to create a good internal working environment. There are members of my campaign team, uh, or f- I guess former campaign team that are now just team spike. They're on my social media team, events team, and things like that, that are helping me to work on trying to grow the party. And they're from all over. They're from every single, I've got members of every single caucus in it. So I think that they're useful. I just, I, I, I wish that we could focus more on that 90 to 95% of things we agree on because it's getting really ugly sometimes. And I, I don't think there's a good, I, that doesn't serve us. Right. Uh, the next one is what are your thoughts on unions? A large number of the things that we enjoy today that or that workers enjoy today are as a direct result of organized labor and uh, uh, industrialists having to uh, create uh, reforms to how they do things in order to either preempt or, you know, up, or appease the organized labor. Government spent many decades trying to stop organized labor. There are the, the, the revolts and the, the putting down of, of, uh, of strikes. There's a long history of this where the, you know, the, the government, especially federal government, would come in, hire privateers to basically kill and torture or, or, or you know, break up or, or violently stop uh, striking workers and things like that. Um, and then eventually they realized, we're not gonna beat them, we have to take it over. And so what they did was they basically put the mob in charge of it, and, uh, and then they created these closed shop rules where now not only do you have to be in a union to work in a specific type of job, 
in many states, you have to work for a specific union, making that union an extension of government. And so, you know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many union members I've talked to who say my union doesn't represent me. They get their raises, they get their bonuses. I get a little something, uh, but I don't feel like they're serving me and I'm paying a ton of money for dues. Most of it's going towards political action for candidates I do not support. Um, so I think that the answer, as with all things, is get government out of it. Allow for, uh, you know, uh, voluntary or, you know, organized, private, organized labor. And you know how you can help laborers uh, read in general, not just organized labor, but just conditions? Look at the economics of it. We have a very high uh, supply of workers right now and a very low demand for them because of regulations that have been put in place that make it increasingly unaffordable to hire people here. So it's not right. desirable. Well, when the supply of something is high and the, de the demand is low, that creates a glut. Good luck. Now you are going to have to fight for a $15 minimum wage, even if you're in a skilled job. We're looking at this the wrong way. Deregulate. Get rid of these absurd regulations. And now the demand for jobs goes up. And over time, the supply of, of people looking for uh, work because they find good jobs goes down. So now right. they're now, now it's the it's not the employer. It's the employee who's in the, the, the catbird seat to be able to negotiate. So I think it just gets looked at the wrong way. Uh, I think that we need to get government out of it, both in terms of the regulations and the sponsoring and, 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 and basically, um, you know, the enshrining of specific unions to be in charge of everything. I think it's, it's backfired terribly for workers. Okay. Uh, the next question is about big tech and censorship. Uh, is it uh, is it a problem of marriage of corporation and state, and what is the solution to try to end censorship? So what we're seeing is a side effect of the larger business environment uh, writ large, which is that uh, thanks to the regulatory environment that was created by these businesses and their lobbies. Uh, it is now increasingly unaffordable to compete or increasingly cost prohibitive to be able to actually compete against the large established players in any field, not just social media, but in, in any field. And as a result, now more and more companies, they gear themselves not towards trying to grow their market share and compete with the big boys, but instead to create an idea that will get bought out or licensed by the big boys, because that's really the only way to make any real money. If they grow to a certain point, they'll just get crushed by, crushed by regulation and, and not be able to actually make any real money. So that has sort of stratified a small handful of companies in every sector, not just in, 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 uh, in tech and in social media. As a result of that, they can call the shots on what can or can't be said. I think that we need to be pushing for deregulation for, for just business in general, um, which would then also help with, you know, kind of setting the Internet free. In the meantime, we have to be making our own thing. I've already started working with alternative social media uh, uh, companies and providers, alternative hosting providers. Uh, and there's a lot that's going to get announced over the following weeks and months. Um, uh, on that regard, but we have to build our own thing. We, we cannot, it's, you know, this, this endless argument between, well, they're a private company and they can do whatever they want. Yeah, that's true. And well, they're restricting our rights and they're restricting our ability to communicate. And, uh, and therefore, you know, we either have to just put up with their narrative or be kicked off. That's also true. Right. The only answer is to build our own thing and, and not just create another social media outlet, but actually build our own thing. And it's not going to be easy. Um, but we're going to have to do it because this is it's only people keep waiting for the pendulum to swing. There's not going to be any pendulum swing. They're just going to keep right. doing this over and over. But as they as they continue to to tighten the noose uh, or tighten the vice, more and more people are going to get kicked off who are going to be looking for something else. So it, it, the silver lining there is as they get more restrictive, once we've built our own thing, we'll have more and more people that for no other reason than they can't get on the major social media will begin using what we built, but we have to build our own thing. It is what it is. Yeah. I've heard that from a lot of people. I was talking to uh, Ryan Dawson on my show and he's someone who's gotten throttled super hard. He was saying that yeah. uh, Austin Peterson's been saying that um, a lot of people have been saying that. So yeah, that's definitely the direction to go in. I think um, with this last election, a lot of people think it was stolen or illegitimate um, I certainly believe there was a lot of fraud that took place and there's not really a good way of retracing it. So what can we do uh, with voting reform and election integrity going into the future? I think, first of all, people come to me and go, why aren't you speaking out against this thing, this potential voter fraud that hurt Donald Trump? 
And my answer is, we have been talking about voter fraud, the fact that voters have been robbed of any alternative to the constant thievery of Republicans and Democrats through the introduction of all these uh, uh, ballot access laws, through the creation of SEC or FEC protections that right. give hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money to Republican candidates while they force the rest of us to spend big money just to even get on the ballot in the first place. You know, a perfect example of that in, uh, in Tennessee, if you wanna run as a Republican or Democrat, you have to get 50 signatures to get on the ballot. That makes sense, right? Like, you know, that way it shows that you have a certain level of seriousness. You can get 50 people to vote for you, to, 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 to sign a petition. If you wanna run as a libertarian, you have to get 56,000. Right. And you have to, uh, and this is in Tennessee, which is not a high population state. And you have to go in really with more like 100,000 because the, the court system that's set up is run entirely by Republicans and Democrats, and they will actively try to, to dismiss, as, to uh, uh, nullify as many of those signatures as possible. So you really have to go in with 100,000 signatures, which costs money and time before we're ever even able to be able to campaign. We have to do all that. To, so yeah, I want to talk about the, 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 the real fraud here, which is that Americans are essentially told you have two choices. Yes, they both suck, but those are your only choices because we've robbed you of any alternative to the system of thievery that we've created. Once we address that, then I'd be more than happy to talk about stuff like mail-in val ballots and you know, absentee balloting and you know voter ID and all that stuff. I think that there's certainly some reforms that can be made. But if you're if you are restricting who they're even allowed to vote for in the first place, then everything past that is is a moot point to me. Yeah, I agree. It was kind of like a slap in the face to suddenly uh, get all these complaints about how the election is rigged. And it's like, oh, really? No shit. And not even just yeah, exactly. against us, but after coming off a of Tulsi Gabbard's campaign, I was like, oh, it's rigged? No way. You know, you wouldn't let her in the debates. You, oh, what gosh. On Paul, what they did to Bernie Ron Sanders. Paul? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you watch them go, OK, uh, what will keep Tulsi off the debate stage? OK, that's the new restriction. But then so, for example, but then Michael Bloomberg comes in and spends half a billion dollars and they go, oh, well, except for Mike Bloomberg. Well, he right. didn't qualify. He didn't. According to your rules, he didn't qualify. But they put him on the stage. Do you know why they put him on the stage? Because he would take the heat from Joe Biden and something like 80 percent of, of uh, Michael uh, Bloomberg's messaging was anti Bernie messaging. He went yeah. in as a torpedo to hurt Blue, to hurt Bernie and really at that point to just try to get people behind Biden and yeah. mission accomplished. Like anyone yeah. who thinks that that Mike Bloomberg, who is one of the most successful people in the history of humankind, intentionally went in to make himself look like a joke like that with no real end game there is a fool. He went in yeah. and did all that to draw the heat off of Joe Biden. Oh, you think Joe Biden's creepy? Here, you can talk about my, my multiple sexual harassment uh, uh, complaints. Right. Oh, you think Joe Biden is just trying to rob this thing? Here, I'm going to spend a half a billion dollars. Oh, you think Joe Biden's in the pocket of billionaires? I'm a billionaire. Like, <laughs> draw the heat off, spend a yeah. bunch of money making Bernie look bad. Oh, now all of a sudden Biden looks good. So the system is entirely rigged, and I don't want to hear anyone talk about it uh, until we address the fact that, you know, Americans aren't even allowed to have more than two choices most of the time. Right. Yeah, and their two choices are pretty much handpicked. Uh, and that yeah. also goes to Trump with all the media coverage he got. Uh, I remember, you know, being a Rand Paul supporter, I was so pissed about that because to me, Rand Paul was the outsider message. And then you have this crony billionaire come in and he gets all of the media coverage, a hundred, you know, he's on every front page of every newspaper at the top of every, oh yep. man, it just pissed me off to no end. So yeah, there are two choices that they choose, you know, with as much yep. manipulation yep. as possible. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, so uh, what's your take on what happened with the Robin Hood app with GameStop with uh, shutting down the ability to buy more stocks and selling purchases that people made without their consent? Well, my understanding is that uh, the, uh, the the brokerage being used by uh, Robinhood is Citadel. Uh, mm -hmm. Citadel had a vested interest in keeping these stocks shorted, uh, and they saw that they were going to be losing billions of dollars. And then I think there was also a relationship between Citadel and Melvin Capital, uh, and also between uh, multiple figures in both the Trump and Biden administration. And yep. uh, I mean, uh, and Janet Yellen, the incoming uh, Treasury yep. Secretary, even the the, the uh, press secretary, uh, Psaki, or however you say your last name, her brother is involved. Like it, it's 
it's pure nepotism. And I, to, to think that, you know, I'd, I'd see people go, well, that's a coincidence. No, it's not a coincidence that these people all are related or know each other or are friends and are working together in concert to push for increasingly strong limitations on the ability of individual investors to legally invest together. Oh, it's market manipulation. What is when you when a hedge fund announces on major media that they're all about to short something? And then Jim right. Cramer, and, and it's not Jim Cramer, but like all of these people show up and go, the big guys are shorting it. Go and short it, short it, short. That's not market manipulation. But a handful <laughs> of, 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 you know, gamers on uh, on on uh, Wall Street bets on, on Reddit saying, we can do that in reverse. We can hold this thing and it will kill their positions as their options come up. And eventually then we can cash out after we've wrecked them, basically take all their money. You want to talk about eat the rich, an unfettered market? <laughs> You can eat the rich and their lunch every single day. And the fact that, right. that you know, the, the, the elites are all coming, including, you know, Liz Warren, or I call her Wall Street Warren, coming in to go, oh, uh, these wild, we have to do something. Yeah, oh, really? Now we have to do something? Like, these are the, <laughs> right. these are the banks that got massive bailouts. These kids are still waiting for their $600 check that was supposedly sent to them Latin earlier this month. And yet- all those hedge funds and banks and everything, they got all their bailouts, you know, wired to them instantly. And now they're mad that, you know, they're they're losing some of their free walk around money uh, to, to these kids that have been screwed by their system the, the entire time. I love uh, that this is happening and it's proof that we need to deregulate the market, remove the regulations, remove the cronies. And you want to talk about, you know, eating the rich in their lunch all day long. This can happen all day long. I say power to the players. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, with Justin Amash leaving the Republican and joining the Libertarian Party, do you think there's hope for people like Thomas Massey, Rand Paul, Mike Lee, and Tulsi Gabbard? Thomas Massey, possibly. Rand Paul, I don't think so. I think mm -hmm. Rand Paul has decided that he's going to – I, I – I, yeah. it is very disappointing. <laughs> It, it does weird. hurt. <laughs> you know, I think of that, the, the scene in, in Star Wars, you were supposed to be the promise. What, like, you know, like here you are, you're supposed to be Ron Paul, but in the Senate, you're not one out of 435 voices. You're one out of a hundred. And, you know, you could, and then, and then he gets screwed just like his dad did. And his response is to like, I think his whole thing is, well, I can get further up if I make friends with the establishment, but he doesn't. I don't think he gets, or maybe he does. I, I don't know. You're voting for Mike Pompeo. Like you're, you're, yeah. you're doing everything that we would say, man, we have to keep Ron, Rand Paul in or else this will happen. Now you're doing it. And you allow someone like Donald Trump to say, well, I'm kind of a libertarian. Just ask Rand Paul. So you're yeah. putting a, a, a libertarian imprimatur on a heavily statist policy pr uh, prescription uh, pr proposal. It's, it's, it is, very, very disappointing. Um, uh, who were the other names you said? Mike Lee. Mike uh, Lee's more Mike, of kind of a, a hard, yeah, he's more of a conservative than a libertarian. I mean, anything's possible, but Justin Amash is kind of uniquely libertarian. I, I The closest thing to, to Justin Amash is Thomas Massey. So right. I could see that happening. Mm -hmm. Tulsi Gabbard is, she's anti-war, she's anti-establishment, and she's also gets that, you know, we need to have free speech. But then it kind of goes downhill from there, like in terms of policy, like she's about as anti-gun as it gets. She's about as, uh, uh, you know, like when it comes to healthcare and stuff like that, like now, should we welcome her in? Yes. But as you said at the beginning of this, welcoming someone in, even if they don't agree with us fully, is totally different than handing them the bit, the baton and saying, go be our champion uh, when right. there are many things that that you know that they disagree with you know basic libertarian concepts on, but I, I think yeah. of that group, probably Thomas Massey would would be my best guess. Would be more likely to come over. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. All right. Um, let's see. We'll just do the last one, I guess. Uh, what What are your plans going forward? Are you planning on running again for vice president or president or local office, or are you kind of open to anything? Or what are you thinking? I don't say there's very little that I say no to my thoughts about 2024 is that it doesn't matter who runs if we don't have a shot in hell of even getting on the debate stage. And so mm -hmm. my focus right now is grow this party, 
grow the party at the local grassroots level, get more wins in the midterms, grow us into something that whoever runs in 2024 is able to actually have a real impact on the race. Imagine this, uh, Don Rainwater in Indiana. He was able to get on the debate stage. He was able to kill it in the debates. And he ended up getting like 12% uh, mm. or 13% or something like that, which is exponentially higher than we've ever done at the presidential level. That same thing could happen if we play our cards right between now and you know the 2024 race. Uh, I think it's also important that whoever we pick for 2024, one lesson that we've learned from this right from 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 this last time around, they need to have demonstrated that they can raise money before they get the nomination, at least like I say a quarter million dollars, which is nothing, but it needs to be a minimum. Uh, they need to uh, they need to uh, commit to making this their full time job all the way through the campaign. Um, and they need to have an actual team and and a marketing plan and a whole thing in place before they get the nomination. They can't get the nomination and then spend weeks making a logo. Like we, 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 that already has to all be done. So we really need to, um, you know, we really need to, when we're looking at our picks, we need to be whittling them out much more early uh, in, in, the, in the contest and saying, who here is taking this seriously? Because this isn't a run for city council or a run for mayor. Uh, which you should also take those seriously. This is a run for president. Show that you are ready to go on to a national stage or even a debate stage if need be, because my plan is to build that infrastructure up so that mm -hmm. whoever gets that infrastructure and that vehicle is able to take it and run with it. Um, and if that lends itself to my being the best pick for 2024, so be it. That's not my primary concern. If it lends itself to someone else who's even better than me being the 2024 candidate, so be it. I, I honestly, my concern is about the party and the movement and growing that. And 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 w to whatever extent I can help with that, I would be happy to do so. But this really is not about me. And there's so much that needs to happen between now and 2024 to even to, for it to even matter who we run. Yeah, well... As I said at the beginning, I am super pumped that you stuck around. Uh, we need more people like you uh, because you get it. You know how to talk to people and uh, you know how to show up places on TV and in media. Places, That's yeah. uh, something a lot of people aren't good at. So uh, whatever you end up doing, we'll be uh, we'll be watching and uh, just tell tell people how they can watch you and how they can support you or keep up with what you're doing. Well, my social media for the the Spike Cohen social media, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Instagram, uh, I'm on TikTok. I need to start actually doing something on TikTok, but I, I'm on TikTok technically. Um, and uh, so those are the main ways to reach me there. Um, I also have my shows that I do on Muddied Waters Media. Muddied Waters Media, you can find that on all of the all of the same uh, platforms, plus all the podcasting apps. Muddied Waters Media is on there as well, um, so it's easy to easy to find me that way. And um, you know, if you like if you like what you hear, then then share it because all I'm trying to do is get the message of liberty out there in a way that connects with everyday people who right now are watching everything that's happening and going, oh God, this is a nightmare. I hate all of this, and we have to provide them with a solution because. Remember when you watching this, everyone watching this and you too read and, and me as well. Remember when you realized that Democrats and Republicans, that it was all a sham, that they were playing good cop, bad cop, and that the whole reason they did that was to keep you invested in voting for one of them, even though they just kept working together to screw you over. Remember mm -hmm. how liberating that was to be like, oh, wow, that's all a con game. OK, I'm going to vote for these people because they represent me. Imagine if we can bring millions more in to have that moment of liberation. And imagine when so many of us get together that we actually start winning races. We start affecting the public conversation. We get on the debate stage without even really having to try to because we're already getting that much attention that they can't ignore us. Um, we can do that. We just have to do the work to grow the message, to get it out there as much as possible, to reach people where they are, to help candidates, de dedicated candidates win their races, and uh, and to be able to actually move the needle towards greater human liberty. All right. Well, thank you for coming on again, Spike, and I'll have to get you back on as things progress. I'm excited for our prospects, and I think things can go well. Thank you, Rita. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys.